Thanks for tuning in to the Just Go Play podcast, where we look to develop and promote a positive youth sports experience. As always, we are available for speaking and private engagements and can be reached at info at justgoplay.ca. You can also catch full video versions of our podcast on our YouTube channel. And don't forget to visit us at justgoplay.ca. Enjoy the episode. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Just Go Play podcast. I'm Daryl Devonish. I'm your host. And I got a great show for you today. My co-host today is Matt Young. Woo! And today we have an interesting young man, Obi Atkinson, a PhD student from Ohio State, talk, doing his research on coaching. Uh, you know what? I'm impressed with this guy. Not only is he young and smart, but he's ambitious. And, you know, I was joking with Matt. I, I wish I had this guy's wisdom at, at 27, a young age is 27. So this guy's, he's going to be on to big, big things. So Obi, thank you for coming today. How you doing? Good. And thank you for having me. Um, think things are going well. Uh, just making sure I got my, uh, all my ends uh, sorted before I head back to Columbus uh, later this week. That's right. That's right. Got to get back to work. Um, Matt, you good? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks, Daryl. So, Obi, I'm as, as interested as Daryl is in hearing what you're doing. Why don't we start off, kick us off by telling us what you're doing in your study. Of. What's your field of study? What's your experience? Where are you coming from? Why should we listen to you? Yeah, no, thanks, Matt. Um, so, my background originally is physical education. Um, when I first came over from Canada to the United States, uh, I started off in South Carolina um, on a soccer scholarship, uh, and then I knew that I wanted to get into teaching right away. Um, I guess you could say uh, I certainly am not the normal where, you know, I think now the average undergrad does three uh, degree changes or three different majors in their lifetime. Um, early on in high school, I knew I wanted to be within teaching and coaching, uh, so I went right into that right away. Um, and then, you know, just South Carolina didn't work for me, um, ended up moving to West Virginia University, uh, spent three years there in physical ed education as well. And then, um, again, transitioned after that into my master's at the Ohio State University, uh, within their new sport coaching program. Um, did that for two years and an opportunity came up, uh, for a graduate assistantship. Uh, sort of Willy Wonka's golden ticket, if you'd like to call it, um, fully funded. And uh, at Ohio State, they have um, a PhD in physical education again. Um, but you can, it, with the PhD, it does allow you to have a little bit more wiggle room in terms of how you take sort of your flexibility requirements uh, for classes. Um, so although you technically my degree is in physical education, I do have also a cognate in youth sport and coaching effectiveness within youth sport and as well um, pedagogy. Awesome. So tell us what that means for those people who don't know that. And, and I, I'm with Daryl, like that's super impressive. Super tell impressive. us what yeah. that yeah. specifically means uh, when you say the youth sport. What is it that you're looking at? Yeah, no, that's a great question because youth sport does, it is a massive field. It's very complex. Um, you know, we, we see sort of in, in a particular, in, within research itself, coaching has transitioned across different fields, in particular over the past 20 to 30 years. Um, you know, it first started off in PE and then it's now gone more psychology. Um, for me itself, though, I'm more focused on the, like the actual, um, how, how coaches are coaching, right? what like the types of feedback they're using how are they designing their sessions um you know and 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 that's just on a research end i also you know i i got to this conclusion um when i you know got to ohio state i wanted to start working with the columbus crew didn't really work out but when you're teaching about coaching when you're researching about coaching and you're not actually coaching i think that's a bit of an error so I reached out to the Ohio State men's soccer coach, uh, Brian Masonave, and said, hey, how can I be of assistance? How can I help? I want to get involved. And so with that group, well, I'm, you know, although it's not youth sport, 
there still are some things that he's doing and we're doing as a coaching staff that is coaching pedagogy. So any type of way that I can better improve myself or impass knowledge or, you know, just become a better and more knowledgeable person about coaching itself, then that works out. Um, different classes that I teach as well are, um, you know, coaching effectiveness for our undergrads, uh, you know, uh, secondary uh, education um, for, for our physical education undergraduates. So a mix of different um, areas within sort of U sport PE and pedagogy. Wow. Yeah, beauty. And before Daryl hops in, I'm cutting him off because Daryl and I have this conversation all the time. You nailed something about uh, 45 seconds ago, which was you can't just study coaching and be effective if you're not actually coaching. And a lot of times, OB, I'm not sure if you, you'd agree with this or not. A lot of times we're selling this, um, co here's how to coach, here's how to coach, come to my seminar, come to my summit. And it's, it's done by academics who have studied it, but actually not applied it. And I think it's such a good point. And I'm not saying it's an and or, like you said, it's an and and. You know, having that solid base of pedagogy and, and research and study behind you, but also actually being able to, uh, you know, put it into play. And pracademic is a, is a word that's becoming more in vogue um, kind of as we go through it. So not just somebody that's sitting on the sidelines, but someone that has, has taught it. For me, always a pet peeve when I've listened to someone who has not coached in the past five years, because I give that a five-year cycle before you're dealing with a complete new set of circumstances. So for me, always a challenge when I'm listening to someone who hasn't been, you know, at that youth sport level, trying to give advice to others who hasn't actually done it within the past five years because that relevance gap uh, um, it gets longer. Obi, what do you think of that? Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I think the the other thing is is there's, as I said before, youth sport is so complex. There's so many different roles and contexts that you can play a part in, like. For myself, although I'm currently not coaching within U Sport, nothing is stopping me from going out and helping volunteer or helping go observe another coach. So if I have an off night, which is rare, but there are loads of coaches that I know I can contact and just say, hey, Rob Smith, what sessions you got going on tonight? Do you mind if I stop in and take a chat, see what's going on? You know, I think it, it being involved doesn't actually mean that you have to be coaching a particular team. There's loads of other roles within an org, whether that's admin, observing a coach, you know, being Great a mentor point. to Great other point. coaches. And that, you know, even with, and, and that's just in a club setting. I mean, we're, you know, you have also higher ed, you have all these other areas that you can be involved in youth sport. And as we know, youth sport, you have collegiate, Ex, like extreme competitive recreation and there is there's such a diversity of places and roles that I, you'd be naive to say that you wouldn't learn anything from each individual context well, that, that's an interesting way of, of looking at it and, and, and getting to know about coaching i i've been listening to you talk for the last couple of minutes i, I want to know why Obi. like why are you so interested in 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 coaching um did something happen to you did you have a, a bad coaching experience? Like what, why such a, a, an interest or a, a love for trying to figure out a better way or, or, or what's going on in the coaching world? Like did, did something happen to you? Um, no, but it's, it, well, I think almost everyone goes through good and negative coaching experiences. I would say though, that that's not my driving factor of why I became a coach, Daryl. I think for me, if you look at impact, there's few professions like coaching similar to teaching that have the, the amount of impact that you can have. So, you know, let, let's just look at it this way in particular in my role right now as a uh, doctoral student. So in my class, I have probably yearly about 20 pre-service physical education teachers who may be coaches later on as well. And, but if we're just looking at a teaching perspective, so I have 20 of those students. Well, in, if each one of those 20 students goes out and gets a job in a, in a I don't know, a, a middle school or elementary school or wherever, then they have a, usually about six classes fill of about 40 students per year. 
the average duration for a teacher is 30 years. So you do the math in terms of impact alone of what I could have on, let's just say someone enjoying a healthy PE or U sport experience down the road. And that's what, that is like the, the be all end all for me is just the impact factor that I can have on a group of people. Wow. I love it. I got so many questions. Amazing. So, so Obi, few questions that I want to have. Number one, you're one of the only people that I've met that has really, one of the few people that I've met that understands that it's a continuum. And you always talk about the coaching environment and PE. Like a lot of people, I don't know, and correct me if I'm wrong, if this, this is, you're not finding this, I find a lot of people silo things off. Well, PE teacher, youth sport coach, collegiate you know, coach. You're one of the few people that I've met that says, no, this is a continuum. And, and, and the only thing that changes is the complexity of what you're presenting and having to know the higher up that you get in terms of the competition model. But uh, for all intents and purposes, you know, quality coaching is quality coaching. We don't need to, you know, uh, lock it off or wall it off from a teacher, a physical education teacher getting the same um, message and coaching and tools that a amateur coach or a youth sport coach might get. So that's my first observation and question. Can you, can you elaborate on that and expand on that? Yeah. Um, in particular in the United States, it's an interesting world because of NCAA. And I think the, the, the NCAA where you can be a coach and that can be your full-time profession does lead to the siloing aspect somewhat. And this is sort of my reasoning behind it, I guess you could say, is that a lot of our undergraduate coaches who we get in say, you ask them, where do you want to coach? And they go, NCAA. And so right away, what they're, sa what they're saying is, is, I am only going to be a collegiate coach, which instantly right away, it, you're siloing yourself as just one person. So then you're disregarding. And as we know, probably... If you can be a very good PE teacher, you could probably also be a very good U sport coach. So, but the issue is, is that the NCAA, there are a lot of sports that are, have, I guess, salaries that are reflective of being full time. That issue doesn't exist in other places like Canada, right? To have a full time collegiate coaching job in Canada is very rare. So we get, we get these people that come in that instantly want to silo themselves via one track. Now, another issue that you have is within another silo, and, and it's interesting because it's not only within the, the sport itself of the, the um, sort of the, the skill levels, but it's also within their own sport itself. That, that's the other crazy thing. It, like they don't think that because they coach youth football, that they're going to gain anything from basketball or from rowing or from any other sport there is. Mm -hmm. And you look across the board and well, what you're doing when you're siloing yourself is you're really just limiting your in, in sources and intakes of knowledge. I mean, if you really want to become a better coach, you're going to keep as broad as possible knowing that, well, Hey, I can pull information from here. I can pull information from here. One of the most, um, one of the, I guess the, the best thing that I took away from my master in sport coaching uh, program at the Ohio State University was how much I learned from other sports and what they're doing. It's in particular at the Ohio State University where within the athletic department, there is what's called this culture of excellence. That is across the board. But each team and each program does their own little unique thing differently. But all those coaches are talking amongst themselves on how to better improve themselves. And we don't see that enough at the youth sport level where a soccer coach is talking to an AAU basketball coach who is talking to a volleyball coach, et cetera. It's, we're even within our own, we see it within the skill levels, but we're even siloing ourselves within our own respective sports. Right. So that, that's organizational alignment. Um, and that can be, that can be vertical or lateral. Um, so, Obi, Daryl and I, we just want to, you have such a, in your opinion, what is the opportunity? What's the opportunity for coaching in the United States and Canada based on what you've seen in research? What are the gaps? You know, we don't want to just be negative. What's the opportunity? I think there's a lot of opportunity. I think that if 
done correctly, you sport can produce these outcomes that just sport in general can produce outcomes that are so hard to replicate in daily life. I mean, you sport is such a unique enterprise and, you know, a lot of people refer to sort of these life lessons, but it even more than just life lessons, like how to interact with people like friendships. I mean, sort of a reason to explore one's body's movement. And, you know, I think it's, there's these so many different things. And, and as a coach, you can be a part of a person's journey through all that. And I think, you know, again, going back to my impact, like you can be so influential in that process. And I think that's one of the coolest things. I mean, I know myself, like, although I'm a PhD student and, you know, I'm, I'm going through my studies, I don't have what I, the bonds that I had with my teammates growing up, going through sport, like nothing like replicates that right now. Yeah. I get little parts, like I'll get a bit of competitiveness here. I'll get some friendships here. I'll get, you know, I don't know, other things to keep me busy here, but nothing is the same where it's an entity that gets everything. And I think, that I think that drives people towards coaching is, you know, you can be so much a part of that experience and you want to share, you know, what you went through as a player on to other people to help make sure they have a positive experience, experiencing those things that you did as well. Now where sort of the other side of the coin comes in is what was experienced by you may not have been the right thing at that time, right? And I think that's the that's sort of the rub that we're getting to now is people going, oh, well, you know, I think Daryl may have alluded to a negative coaching experience by someone that you had been coached before and saying, well, you know, I went through fit, when, when, when I made a mistake, my coach used um, fitness as punishment and that toughened me up. So that must toughen kids up now. And if it worked then, it has to work now. And it's a total disregard for, well, maybe what you had happened to you. Yeah, it may, you may feel it may have toughened you up, but it's not the right practice. And I think that's where some things get a bit iffy. But in terms of opportunity, there's so much opportunity within sport. And it's across the board, like there whether you're you're in rec, whether you're in a club, whether you're in uh, interscholastic, like the amount of impact and influence that a coach can have on one person's life is outstanding. Yeah, no, no disagreement there. And and you're right. The saying is you you coach the way you were coached, um, you know, which as we know doesn't uh, fit in a in a society that's changing pretty much you know weekly now. Um, in terms of needs and wants and, and where these these young men and women are in terms of their development, not only their physical development, but their social, you know, emotional and mental development as well. Um, so what one of the things that, that I like is that the Ohio State has a master's in coach development. Can you, and a, and a question that, that I've had, and then I'll zip it and let Daryl ask a bunch of questions, is the centralization of coach education. So both in Canada and the U.S., we seem to have a couple of, uh, of, of national organizations that have been tasked with covering coaching for the entire landscape. In your research, has that proven to be effective? Is there a better model? I mean, you're coming from both because you've, you've seen uh, what those coaching clinics offer, but then also you've had your whole experience at, at The Ohio State University in, in your undergrad. Give us some context on that. So the, the biggest issue right now within coach development is still the focus on one topic, and that's what Cote and Gilbert described as professional knowledge, which is uh, techniques, tactics, and skills. So when you go to, uh, and I think it was in 2006, uh, Lefebvre and colleagues did a systematic review on what coach development programs were out there. And... Um, very few were on interpersonal knowledge or intrapersonal knowledge. And I think that's an absolute massive gap right now within the coach development um, certification route is oftentimes, 
and in my own experience, people go to these development things like it's a certification process. It really is just to see, oh, well, can you coach at a certain level? Yet what they grade you on is, well, do you know your techniques and tactics? And can you go through one little session that takes you through sort of the basic knowledge? Great, you can do that. Perfect. Move on. Go pay thousands of dollars for another little check on the box. Mm-hmm. And we, we know that that doesn't work. I mean, any solid intervention has to work over at least 15 weeks. So what's the point in showing up and rocking up on a weekend, going through some instructor taking you through some drills or whatever, and then you repeating it and they saying, great, awesome, you're a good coach. Well, I, I don't think it works like that. And I think that's a bit of the issue. And and the other issue within sort of coach education, coach development within higher education is, well, there's no consistency. I mean, right now, there's only, I want to say five people that do a PhD, maybe only 30 that do um, masters and maybe only 30 that do majors. And if you were to look at all their curriculums, I would be curious to see how much is actually similar. My guess is not much. And I think when we're looking at an overarching body and, you know, another area of concern is we have what's called these coaching standards. Yes, we have these standards, but there's like over 30 components to them. And it goes, well, how are we actually holding our coaches, um, you know, accountable? Okay, so if we have these standards, but they're just standards, they're just out there. We have these accreditation systems, but they're just accreditation systems. There's no one actually holding people accountable to what is out there and mandated. So well, what's either you hold them accountable to what's mandated or you just get rid of what's mandated. And I, and I think that's the issue is within sort of this coach development area is, is they said, okay, well, we can't have the wild, wild west out here. We need something, but yet they, it's almost like, well, we're just going to kind of dip our toe in the water. It's either you you go in a hundred percent and you have to hold institutions, organizations, clubs, et cetera, accountable, or you do away with it because I mean, there's these clubs out there that are trying their best to hold accountable, but what happens when they're getting hold accountable? Well, that's costly. Yet they can look down the road on the other side of town and the other club isn't doing the same thing and they're saving a bunch of money. So where do you fall? And I think that's the, that's the real rub when it comes down to sort of this development organization, broad picture government of coaching within uh, youth sport or within, you know, coach education of higher ed. Oh man. Hey, listen to you talk. I, 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 I feel like, these certifications that these people are getting from these coaching courses, it's like a driver's license. Just because you get a driver's license just means you're allowed to drive. It doesn't mean you're good at driving. And, and I think what I'm hearing from you is that these coaches almost need to go through a, a, an internship, you know, and someone's accountable to them before we can release them. Because I got, I, I know some kids that are getting their license right now and I, I'm, I'm scared that these guys are going to be driving on the road because I know they shouldn't be, but they're good enough to pass the test on that day. Is it, how, how do you, like, how do we combat that? Or, and as you said, there's no money to, to, to go that, that route. Yeah. It, it's a really good point, uh, Daryl as well. Um, and if, if we use your example of drivers licensing, right? Like I can go take my dr- test right my basic test and get certified to drive fair enough and the only way we actually you know the only way people actually get in a car and get more time driving is you know i know back home it's called young drivers but it's linked to the insurance right where if you do this course which has repetition repetition times in a car then you decrease your insurance right so i mean we know that car insurance, especially for people who are first time, who are younger in age, tend to be higher in price. So they've countered that by saying, well, you take this young driver's course, right? You have six sessions in a car with a mentor driver. You go to class and you get gain more knowledge on it. 
then what we'll do is we'll reduce your uh, initial insurance. That might be a route that U Sport explores. Um, that might be a way where it goes down. But I think the other issue that we have within U Sport is, and coaching is, what people classify as essential knowledge to coach, right? And I think we're missing, we're getting away from that. We're, you know, although in the, the performance aspect of sport, there is a lot of science-based research and literature, and you should be monitoring heart rates and injuries and recoveries and periodization, where you don't need that. And we're losing touch with that at U Sport itself. I think if we if we really just double down on well what is good pedagogy what does good pedagogy within coaching look like well what how can we how can we better place a volunteer coach who has never coached that particular sport how can we best place them in their current context and it may not even include anything to do with their sport in terms of knowledge but we may be focusing on how is it best to hold a conversation with someone who's eight years old? How can we turn you into a better reflector on your own practice? Because these things, regardless of what sport your child or your uh, whatever may be in, carries over whether it's soccer, badminton, volleyball, and those skills can be transferred across. How you give feedback, how you give you know, positive reinforcement or criticism. And I think some of these areas we're, we're really missing out on. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. And not only does it transfer into different sports, it transfers into people's lives, how to be a good um, friend, peer, relationship, manager, mentor, partner, um, you know, and that's one of the things, and, and Obi, you and I have talked about this a lot. Um, why, why aren't these courses mandatory because these are co these, these are courses in interpersonal relationships and communication and if you look at what's going on right now it seems like we could all use a little top up on uh, on how to get on the same on the same page and how to how to really connect better connect with other people's point of point of views so i really like that example that you gave about the insurance being the lever um, because money talks so and, and, you know, and you and I have had this conversation if you had a, situ a, a situation whereby in your state you know, so you're in the state of Ohio, the Ohio state says to their local governing insurance agency, look at, we're going to give these courses. These courses are going to save you millions of dollars in downstream bad experiences and, and, and heaven forbid, uh, abusive case scenarios. Um, so th this is good, really going to help you. And if you do this, your premiums will be lowered for your access to fields, for all of that stuff. I, and I agree with you, Obi. I think that's the only way we're going to be able to bring in the, 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 the accountability needed. Because going back to the beginning of this conversation, you made a big statement and you said, you know, there's very few vocations that allow you to have the biggest impact on uh, uh, this much of an impact. And if we actually believe that broadly, and you know, we're paying some coaches five, six, seven, eight million dollars a year. So clearly we believe it. Um, you know, if we're good, if we believe that, then we need to put our money where our mouth is and invest in the, in the, in the preservation of the quality around that. Um, you know, we can't keep saying, well, they're just volunteer or, you know, we'll, we'll just let them get, get away with the basics. I, I like where you and Daryl went about that stepped kind of, as you get higher, you learn more, but the base is the foundation is rock solid and covers a lot of the things that we talk about when we talk about the four C's, the five C's, if you add culture in there. Uh, Obi, what, what, what do you think? What's your response? Yeah, to? I, I agree. And, and I think the, I think it was John O'Sullivan compared volunteer coaches to volunteer firefighters. And I can't think of a, a better example is, you know, I, I couldn't imagine some of the things that, we say, oh, well, don't worry about it because you're a volunteer coach. Oh, I, I, mm, we'd like you to get certified, but don't worry about it. You're just a volunteer. We can't really hold you accountable. Well, you know, as John O'Sullivan pointed out, well, what if we did the same with our volunteer firefighters? Uh, you, you couldn't imagine a world with like that look that way. And, you know, and going back on the other case with you know, some of the, the holding sort of and avoiding these big time scenarios or big time ethical breaches. I think also people don't realize that sort of the same level of 
issues that happened, whether it was, you know, Larry Nassar at MSU or uh, the Jerry Sandusky at Penn State, those happen at U Sport. Although they don't get necessarily the attention and mm-hmm. sort of the widespread media, they do happen at U Sport. And so I think, you know, those sort of cases and, and I think sort of going back, and I know I'm, I'm kind of repeating myself, but when I mentioned they're like almost too scientific, like, you know, I'm, I'm doing research right now that's comparing every state and what their policies are for interscholastic coaches. And I think it's a great concern that we're, a lot of states are currently requiring their coaches to take first aid, CPR, concussion, heat illness annually or biannually, yet their coaching fundamentals course, it's just a check off the box and then they're done. One time. So, so, so at what point do we, do we lose touch with what actually is going on? Because although yes, th- those other things are important and yes, I'm not discrediting that, but I think, you know, at the end of the day, when we're talking about in particular, uh, an ab- an absolute health epidemic that's going on in this country and we're having more and more kids drop out of sport, although it doesn't get that, so-called flashy lawsuit that hits the media well 70 percent you know again as john o'sullivan said 70 percent of kids are dropping out of sport at age 13 well now we're getting more obesity rates are through the roof inactivities through the roof sport was an avenue that helped keep those decrease of costs from a health standpoint of a nation down and now we're seeing kids dropping out of sport because they're not enjoying it well when, when do we say, hey, we actually need to focus on what coaching actually is mm-hmm. and train coaches about what coaching actually is? So then, you know, something like positive relationship with their players keeps them in sport and actually has them with this mindset that, hey, sport is enjoyable and I can play sport the rest of my life. Absolutely. I mean, if we reported stats that said 70% of kids were dropping out of school, uh, at age 13 or any other institution at age 13, you, you bet your bottom dollar there would be an immediate intervention. But for some reason, we don't do it, do it with sports. And like you said, we default to the, oh, they're just volunteers. Oh, don't worry about it. Oh, it's just a, and, and in doing that, it, we reinforce how, how we marginalize it. We minimize the importance of key figures. And, and we all know developmentally, you know, having a good coach at a young age for a young boy and girl is, is just so imperative. It, it's like, which to many uh, begs the question, why don't, why aren't we paying more attention to it? Why aren't we being a little bit stronger on the prerequisites to doing that? Uh, you know, why aren't we, why aren't we diving in and providing the better experience? Because everything that you mentioned, Obi, and you're right, it's the first aid, it's that it's all those legal check boxes we're checking them off because legally uh, if something should happen uh, to a kid and they and they get exasperated or whatever faint and legally we don't know how to do it well we're in big trouble but hey listen if legally um, someone gets into an entire profession a, a set 8.7 and 12.6 billion dollar a year profession with no oversight as a pedophile or creepy character and starts you know abusing whether it's physically mentally uh young men and women we don't seem to care about that that's it, it, we, we we it's it's just the most bizarre um paradigm when you when you look at it that way and uh i know daryl you you have lots of points in on this yeah. too but Obi, what do you think of that who's going first yeah, sorry Joe. i just want to jump in on that point here um the the other really interesting thing and i guess what made me kind of click on it was when i was younger and I was, you know, going through the process of a soccer scholarship and I went to a, a camp and it was in, they brought some, I think it was academy coaches over from Manchester United to the greater Toronto area. And, and this coach sort of sent, and he, and he probably the best coach of the lot. You could tell he was the leader and everything like that. And he was with the youngest age group. And I said, you know, got to know him. And I just said, you know, do you ever want to get with the first team in that? And he said, no, I am a youth sport coach. And that is, you know, he took it upon himself that that's where he fit in. Right. And I think we really struggle with that. 
I, again, I'm not so sure with Canada, but in my time in the U.S., we've really struggled with that, that people don't come in. Like for my undergrad class and all my times with coaching undergraduate students, no one comes in and says, I am a youth coach. That's what I want to be. That is my bread and butter. And that is what I am the best at. It, it's always this like, no, I want to get to collegiate. I want to get to professional. A youth sport is only a stepping stone to get there, which is a, I think is a very big key fundamental flaw in that is, is that we don't have people that it seems want to coach youth sport and know they are youth sport coaches and take pride in being that. Yeah, but that's because of the economic model. The economics oh, yeah. themselves, they, hey, listen, if you're going to pay, if you're going to say, Matt, Daryl, you guys will use sport coaches. We want you to coach this team. We'll pay eight million bucks a year. There's going to be a big lineup. Man, I'm there. So, yeah. so you know that 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 exposes the flaws of uh, of our free market, you know, free market capitalism right there. Um, but I but but I don't disagree with you, Obi. That that's for sure, and that's consistent with Scandinavian countries where the top coaches who are being paid oh, yeah. at the top bucks also come down and and coach at the at the lower levels not just for their own self-interest but really to help coach the coaches and mm -hmm. develop the players at the at the youth sport levels you see that a lot in the scandinavian countries so you know your point is well taken there's people doing it so and they're, and they're doing pretty damn well so uh it, it, it's got to be working daryl you wanted to jump in yeah will, will that model ever be adopted here you think like where we have these these high level coaches working with the youth i got another question about do you think it, that'll ever happen here? Unless, I guess, well, as to Matt's point, unless someone starts paying dough. Uh, the only way I could see it is what I guess we've sort of seen MLS take on board, which is a bit, um, you know, it's a European model, obviously, with mm -hmm. the academy structure, where because the, a certain team, like we would say a youth team and a youth setup, is under embedded within that professional context, that that professional team can then pay for those roles and positions in the lower sense but currently right now there, there is not that structure outside of um soccer like you don't see it in youth football right we don't see like the detroit lions who are then aligned to an academy within those that hold those clubs within the detroit area right you see it's, it's a lot more broken and there's not a particular i guess you know, a good example of this would be in my area, uh, Vancouver Whitecaps, right, have what they've done is they've created partnerships with a bunch of major clubs within the area. And then there's like that tiered system. Although, in my opinion, I think there might be a couple too many tiers. There at least is a tiered system and a pathway where Vancouver Whitecaps is paying a very livable wage for those so-called full-time youth coaches. And that, that led me to the next question I was going to ask. Why aren't the, I guess, the governing bodies like the, the pro teams or why aren't they taking more responsibility knowing that these are future fans, okay? Because more people loving the game means more fans for them. And also now they're going down and they're building instead of buying players. So if they went down and started building these kids up, there's more – thousands more kids that are playing soccer or thousands more kids playing hockey or basketball and, and more people having fun. And it's not all about the W's it's we we've, we've got it's about the, D's, the development. It's yeah. It's about the D's. I like that. Yeah. And, and no, it's, it's a great, it's a great point, Daryl. And I think although it may not be, although it may come as development of young kids, I think also, opportunity um i believe it was a couple of years ago and over in germany the the big soccer club over there just went around and had a community initiative and you see it a lot of times worldwide but they just built all these blue pitches like blue mini soccer pitches around the community and now if whatever if players were playing there and made it into their system great but it was pretty much to tie in the community to that club and give mm -hmm. kids the opportunity to just play i mean now, whether they were playing soccer on those fields or basketball on those fields or handball on those fields they didn't it didn't matter but it's just get in there sort of using their power as a brand within the community to, pro to provide those opportunities for kids just to play explore and develop 
I, I, I don't know if it'll ever happen in the I, U.S. I, yeah, I, but I think that's that. That might be the answer. Not that I, I have the answer, but I mean, I, I think that if those governing bodies, Soccer Canada or Canada Soccer, and the whatever governing pro league got together and said we need to make sure a certain number of funds go towards coaches at that level and affiliations and parks and whatnot. That's how they grow the game again. One particular issue that they have in particular in the U S though, is although it may seem simple, like as we have in Canada, where it's Canada soccer that oversees, you know, your provincial and territorial bodies, and then they oversee sort of your regional in the U S you have three organizing bodies just in soccer alone. So, I mean, then in football, you have the NFL, you have flag football, you have Pop Warner, you have all these things. So you have, again, it's so much more, everyone wants their sort of slice of the pie on things that, mm -hmm. well, a shared vision almost isn't possible among all the key stakeholders, unless, I don't know, light bulb, they all sit at one table and figure out what's best for everyone. But, you know, we haven't seen that in quite some time. In any sport, in any capacity yeah so true so true okay so you know we're, we've talked a lot about you know what with the gaps the opportunities uh what you're seeing your research your study um you know we talked about the centralization effective or not effective um do, did you answer that ob in terms of do you think uh, um, the approach like the ohio state is doing for a kind of a regional approach might be more impactful than trying to get everybody aligned with something that's coming out of Washington or Ottawa? I think, I think it would have benefits. I think, um, I'll, I'll give a good example. So within the, the state of Michigan, um, every summer now, Michigan State has a summer, summer coaching school. And if you go and take that school, which is over a weekend, um, at, I believe it's, quite a quite a decent cost like 180 so it's very reasonable is that those same coaches that register for that actually can get credit for their certification that covers like to become a, a code interscholastic coach so i think if you can if you can manage to make it accessible for people like in particular in the u.s like per state or if in canada do regional areas and we were to centralize it based upon sort of like the regions, I think you could actually get more people involved. I think the issue sometimes is though we have one of two extremes. We either have having it coming from way up above mm -hmm. and it never actually trickles down, or you have these random things come up that aren't, or I would call them workshops, interventions, but unfortunately they're not grounded in theory they're usually low in participants they usually get no funding so they're done after about two or three years mm -hmm. and you know they i mean most times they only have you know one workshop for two hours well you can't tell me that people are learning within one workshop for two hours too much and, no way. and so no I, way. Think, I think that's the issue is well where can we actually find that middle ground and i think michigan state by doing their you know through the U sport institute and the summer school they've actually found a really nice middle ground. And I think, you know, that might be something down the road that Ohio State looks to do. Um, you know, I, I think Kansas University has something similar for Kansas, um, but I think that might be somewhere, maybe get in the higher ed, you know, as an institution in there with athletic departments where they can work with some funding that they may have that you know goes back through and supports the continuous coach education within the state and that to me seems like a way to bridge what's federal and what's the random local workshop totally and that's and that's also common sense because because then you're creating that alignment that you talk about that's missing in your community in your state you're creating that allegiance you're creating that pathway um, you know, this is where you're starting, but look at, we're, we're going to have all the, the Ohio state coaches or all the Michigan state coaches, the best coaches you can learn from them. Those rooms would be packed. Um, it, you know, so being able to offer that at an affordable price point gives you that cachet of, Hey, wow, that's the wow factor. Wow. This is exciting. And I'm learning. And, you know, my weekend course was the starter. That was my basics. So I have coaching 101. If I want to go to coaching 102, then I need a full 
week of this in session modeling stuff. And then if I want to go to 103, 104, and then my pay structure actually follows my progression in coaching. Um, it's not based on my opinion or my appointment or because I did something here or there. It's actually based on a forward progression and, and me demonstrating that I've, I've got an understanding of the skills required at those varying levels. So I really like that. And I, I really hope that more provinces and states follow those examples because I think they're really powerful examples. And, and when you tie in the ability to lever the accountability with the state insurance people who should be thrilled that, hey, listen, if, if you took this course, you're going to get a significant discount on your, your insurance fees for the year, the field fees or whatever those things are, because I think that's the carrot and the stick, um, being, being able to have the both of those. The other, the other quick note on that as well is, if I believe correctly, most every state, in particular in the U.S., has a what's called land grant institution that is required to give back to the state in some capacity. So again, if we're talking about sort of ticking a box per se, what a great opportunity. We know that there are a lot of coaches out there. So why not have that as a method of you giving back and helping improve an area of education, improve a certain population of people within your own state? I wanted to add to this. What about teachers? Making teachers have to coach. If they're, they're already connected with the youth in schools, you know, I know if I went back, I used to be a teacher, by the way. If I went back and I was a principal, I'd make every teacher have to coach something. And I, I you know, going back with your model there, you know, and you teach a lot of these teachers, phys ed teachers, now, if, if that was another piece that they had to add on that they all had to be, you know, able to coach and learned all the fundamentals to, to be able to do that. What, what are your thoughts on that in terms of teachers like that, that come through Ohio state, do they mostly, if they're in phys ed, they're probably going to be coaches anyway. But I mean, like if you're teaching other subjects, a, a, a teacher to me is a coach. So Fortunately, in Ontario, there's lots of teachers who want to teach because teaching is a well-paid and respected profession. Um, currently within the U.S., and I, I might be a few numbers off on this, but if I remember correctly, 11 to 13 states right now have what is informally called a warm body rule or a warm body law where um, there's such a lack of teachers within those states that all they have to do is do a basic two-week certification program and they are certified to teach any subject in any school. Um, so that opens a lot of liability and legislative issues. Um, and and what, what's even more crazy is how much money states spend replacing those teachers of those teachers who go down that route um that where they they have to take minimum qualifications to become a teacher 98 percent of those teachers don't return back to teaching so i'll give you a great example is you know texas and dallas has this issue so dallas is about metropolitan dallas about three thousand people whatever that would be in schools and teachers um you know columbus is a million um, and we got quite a few, but you know, they're having to, re of, of, of their teaching body, 30% of those teachers are the ones who are on sort of this warm body law area. And then with of that 98%, so they're already spending so much money for finding new teachers, interview, this whole retention thing. So I, I think it depends on the state. It depends on the province. If, if you have, teachers that you know that come from good teacher ed programs sure here's a great example in all of canada there's a hundred universities and colleges within the u.s there's over five thousand so how do we know what are what classifies as really good teacher education programs how do we know what is how do we know that they're learning the right methods to be a good teacher that could also transfer over to be good coaching I know that if you go to Ohio State as a physical educator, you're going to get one of the best physical education degrees there is, but I don't know about another university 
that maybe I don't know or I haven't heard of that does offer PE? Well, I don't know their curriculum. I don't know who, who the faculty is there. So I think certain states might be able to get away with that and certain provinces might be able to get to. But if you do go from a federal mandate standpoint, that can open a really ugly can of worms rather quickly. Yeah, for sure. And the fact it's called warm body legislation or law, it's even I referred to that. All that. Kind of says kind of says what we're 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 reaping what we've sown there. We're we're reaping what we've sown there. Okay, so Obi, hey, listen, thanks so much for 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 coming on and sharing your wisdom and knowledge again. To echo what Daryl said, at twenty seven years old, super impressive, bright future. The fact that you're just learning all of this, I, I can't wait to hear about your your exploits when you get into the youth coaching and you start coaching, or when you're turning out your students to get into the youth, youth coaching field and, and you know, your students are better having you. We always end with first steps. So Daryl always usually wraps it up with saying, okay, what, what, are the, what are the three first steps? So this is all about, I guess, really quality coaching. And if we wanna increase the quality of coaching, and we're putting you on the spot, uh, I'll keep talking and let you think about it. If we wanna increase the quality of coaching in our, our youth sports system, what are three first steps you think we need to do? Uh, first one, and again, I can't thank you both enough for having me on here. Um, but it is, it is a really good question. Um, and I, and I would expect that you probably have quite a bit of variability on this, but also quite a bit of overlap. I think the number one thing that comes down to is availability. If it's not available, people aren't going to do it. And we know that coach education opportunities don't happen often enough in enough locations. Mm -hmm. So how can we make it more available to the volunteer coach, the person who is coaching at the recreation level, the people that, okay, well, maybe I'm just coaching for one year. Well, they're still flipping important because we need to get them educated, even mm -hmm. if they know they're, we're only going to coach them for one year because they may be coaching 15 kids and we want all those 15 kids to return, even if they're not going to. I think this, the, the second biggest one that we need to really, really focus on is cost. Right now within the US, coaching education isn't cheap, which puts a lot of people off. And within that as well is we're, we don't tailor the costs and the needs to all the particular contexts like we talked about earlier. Right now, I mean, as sort of the development models go, we're, we're, we're on this, you need to get all the way here and you need to continuously educate. But what also goes is the price goes up and up and up. I mean, I think at some point, like as, as much as I'd love to continue my education right now within U.S. soccer, well, I'm sorry, it's expensive. I mean, I'm still a student. I mean, it, for me to go then take off, book a week off to go get hotel rooms plus the registration fee, that adds up. And you know, that's pretty tough. And I would say that for a lot of people, whether they're students, whether they're parents, whether they're, you know, I mean, you're taking sacrifices here and not everyone's in that position to pay the cost that coaching education right now is slated at. Um, the last, the last point, and I think the, the biggest one, um, and the most important to me is we need to bridge the gap between research and practice. And I always joke with people and I say, there's no more of a closed off entity than sport. So when I go as a coach um, researcher and I want to get in, I need to know the person before I can even get even a sniff at getting in to do any type of research. And I think, we need to be more open. But at the same time, we don't do a very good enough job as researchers to inform coaches of what is actually found because giving them an academic article isn't good enough. Not many people want to spend their evenings reading an academic article five times to figure out what the results are. So how then, how then can we as researchers do a better job to keep those coaches who actually we're on our study informed of what the results were in a way that they can understand. And I think that has to be bridged, bridged quickly because right now, again, as we talked about earlier with silos, we're in too often two different silos. Brilliant. Wow. <laughs> Very 
to the point. Matt, you want to go? Yeah, you know what? I think he, he nailed OB's it. Expert, he nailed he's got some great context. Uh, you know, affordability, accessibility, accountability uh, are, are three things that I also agree with. Uh, and, you know, he hit the nail on the head with all three. Accessibility. You know, we can't say, hey, listen, you need to be – you, you need to get certified as coach before you step on the field and then have one sitting in your province every seven months. Like that just doesn't work for people. So, you know, hopefully with, with more people now understanding that there's this great thing called zoom and they can do it digitally. Hopefully we can bridge that gap a lot more easily. And, and, and it's forced a lot of organizations. I know Canada soccer has taken a lot of their education, if not all of it online. So, so hopefully that helps that, um, accessibility point that Obi brought up because it's huge. Uh, affordability too drives me nuts. I mean, hey, listen, if you if you you, you want to take money out of a volunteer coach's pocket, you know, number one, there better be some great value. Show them how it's going to tie into being a great dad, mom, uh, employee, boss, manager, etc. More than just the field, and and then give them something, um, you know, and and make it affordable, just like he said. So I, I couldn't I couldn't agree more there. And you know, for me, the, the academic. You know, I appreciate that's 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 from Obi's lens because that's where he comes from. So I totally appreciate that. For me, it would be the accountability. Going back to what he said about making sure that nobody nobody steps on the field to create an impact which is going to be lasting with a young man or woman that does not have an understanding of what quality coaching needs are, and and, and those are from the kids. We do such a good job, which we've all talked about you know, CPR, first aid, check this, you know, background check. We cover our asses administratively. It's all about us and the administration. It's not about the athletes. We've forgotten that we're supposed to be serving the athletes. Where's their big part of that? Um, so I think for me, I would add that word accountability and, you know, into what Obi has said as the, as the first three steps to really get coaching back to where it needs to be, which is on a, a, a track. This is an important vocation. I don't care if you're not making the $8 million, it's still important. It needs to be viewed as such. But the, at the firefighting analogy, if you sign up for it, this is what you sign up for. If you're not interested, don't sign up because you're not getting an out. You're not getting an out. You cannot, it's too important. And we've gone too long in our system in not having it and seeing the results. So why would we continue to do the same things? Wow. I agree with both of you guys. <laughs> Listen. The, the biggest thing to me that I got, I got a lot of things out of you today, Obi. Impact. I'm, I'm, I'm running with impact. And I think anyone listening to this is a coach or wants to be a coach. That, that just like hit me right in the head. And, you know, you, if you want to be a coach and, and make an impact on these kids or an impression, because as we said, it, it's, it's so important to the development of these kids. Um, get yourself educated, get yourself mentorship. You, you can't just go, as Matt said, you can't coach people the way you were coached and just assume that that's going to work. You, you have to get out there and educate yourself, learn, be observant, no learn, wing it. learn how to get, do not wing it, learn how to be observant. Um, and the accountability piece as Matt, uh, I can't, that, that also rings loudly in my ears. You got to be accountable to the way you met these kids and how you're going to leave these kids because you, you, you don't realize how important again for my, in my life and, and most of your guys' life, it sounds like a coach helped direct you guys to your profession, gave you some of your values. So that accountability piece, that, that's so important to these kids. And that said it, it's kid centric. It's not about us. It's not about the W's. It's about making these kids better. So on that note, OB, buddy, I'm so impressed with you. Thank you for being here today. Matt, I was a pleasure. Just go play guys, get out there and just go play. If you like this podcast, subscribe, share this with your friends. That's the fee. Okay. Thank you guys. Take care. Thanks, Daryl. Thanks, Obi.